Oh. So there's a, a large, self-proclaimed, progressive Christian church in Nashville, Tennessee. And they recently uh, promoted their position on the Bible. Are you ready? It looks like, oh, I guess I better turn this on. <laughs> it looks like this. Oh, you can't hardly see it. The Bible, this is their position of this progressive Christian church. And this is now. The Bible isn't the Word of God. It isn't self-interpreting. It isn't a science book. It isn't an answer or a rule book. And it is not inerrant or infallible. This is a, a progressive Christian church. It, it's a church. Yeah, yeah. Then what is it? Okay, what the Bible is. It's a product of community. It's a, it's a library of texts. It's multivocal. It, it, it's, it's a human response to God. It's living and dynamic. It's baloney. It's baloney is what it is. And uh, this simply is... Well, listen... When did Satan begin attacking the Word of God? Garden of Eden. Before, before a single word was written down, Satan was already attacking. So this is not something new. It's not really a surprise. Um, Satan has been invested in attacking and tearing down God's Word right from the beginning. So when, when we were invited to come here 12 years ago, one reason we were invited to be pastors of this church was because of our rock-solid belief that this book is God's Word. It is inerrant. Everything it teaches is true and correct. It is without error. And we believe that with all of our heart. Not only do we stand on the absolute truthfulness of the New Testament things, the nice things that Jesus teaches us and that the apostles teach us, but we also believe that the historical account in this book of how the world was created, we believe is 100% accurate. It is not just some fabrication of man saying, well, let's see, let's make up a story about how it all began. No, we believe that God's word is absolutely without error. We not only believe in the Genesis account of creation, we believe in the Genesis account of a worldwide flood that literally covered the earth because of the rebellion of mankind against God at that time. We believe not only in the creation and the flood, but we believe in the account that the nation of Israel was in Egypt and God delivered them and took them through the Red Sea and opened it up. We believe every one of the miracles that are recorded in this book. And we're no strangers to the fact that there have been churches all along in America that claim to be churches, claim to represent the truth, that don't believe in the miracles of the Bible. I remember when my father, many years ago, told about his older brother who got saved and went off to seminary to prepare for the ministry and went to a Baptist seminary and came home an atheist. And my father was absolutely devastated. How is that possible? To go to seminary, to prepare for being a minister of the word and come home not believing anything anymore. Because in fact, Satan is one who has constantly attacked the authenticity of this book. Constantly attacked it and tried to tear it down. And sadly, even in many Christian colleges across America, God's word continues to be hammered and attacked and the, the adversary um, is constantly working. Now, we not only believe that, that, that this book is accurate, but we recognize from the very first book from Genesis, chapter 12, that God chose a man, Abraham. It doesn't matter whether we like that story or not. That's what God's Word tells us, that God did that. And we know that through Abraham and his descendants, he revealed himself to us. And... This book is a revelation of who God is, but he recorded it, he gave it to descendants of Abraham, almost exclusively, not entirely, there's a few Gentile authors, but very few, and that, and that he revealed himself through Abraham and through his son, Jesus Christ, who would be born into the descendants of Abraham. And amazingly, we're living at a time right now when the same descendants of Abraham who've been gone from the promised land of Israel for 2,000 years are suddenly there again. 
Well, that kind of is a head scratcher because that's never happened in the history of mankind before. And then when we go back and look at the promises that God made to Abraham, well, we have another head scratcher because God in Genesis chapter 17 said to Abraham, no longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. Now remember, when God told Abraham this, he still did not have the son of promise. Isaac had not even been conceived yet at this point. And Abram was 99 years old and Sarah was 89 years old. And God is promising to give him a whole bunch of descendants. He doesn't even have one yet. <laughs> and God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you. And he says that, he kind of repeats himself there, doesn't he? God kind of repeats himself about Abraham and his descendants, his descendants after him. I think maybe that's important. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as a temporary possession. No, it says as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Well, this kind of raises a conundrum for us. This presents a challenge for us because as we read these words, it, 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 it causes us then to ask some questions. And by the way, not all Bible-believing Christians will come up with the same answer in this, and we need to be gracious in understanding that, that there, there are some differences of opinion. But, but this, for me, it presents a question. And the question is, is what's happening in the land of Israel today with the Jewish people going back to the land of Israel is that a fulfillment of Old Testament biblical prophecy or is it just a fluke coincidence and uh, I think you if you've been here very long you know what my answer will be in this however it's a valid question to ask and it's one that we ought to ask with grace and and not with a spirit of condemnation because there are truly Bible-believing Christians who come out with a slightly different answer in this. So let, let's approach this with a spirit of humility and not a spirit of condemnation or judgment. This proposes a second question that I would like to ask. Does a literal understanding of historical accounts in the Bible imply a literal understanding of prophetic passages as well? Because if we believe that the creation isn't just a myth... The, the, the creation that's recorded here isn't just a myth. If we believe the flood that's recorded here isn't just a myth or a legend, if we believe that the children of Israel being delivered through the Red Sea isn't just a fabrication or an enhancement of what really happened, if we believe those things to be true, then does that not also have an impact on how we interpret Old Testament prophecy? Can we take one to be literal and accurate, and, and even though the descriptions of it are often poetic, and often figurative, do, do we, but, but it's still a description. Do, if we take that literally, does that, does that have any impact on how we understand biblical prophecy? Well, that's uh, really worth thinking about and, and asking that question. Now, uh, the answers, how we answer those questions is going to have a huge implication for how we understand what Scripture has to say about what is coming next. What is coming next? I mean, look nobody's going to deny the fact that we're, we've been through some pretty weird things in this last year, right? Politically, socially, uh, morally, uh, spiritually, the, things are getting shaken up, aren't they? All right, we're living in some pretty strange times. So as God's people, where do we look for some stability? Where do we go for some, some orientation about what's happening? Does Scripture give us any guidance at all about where we're at and what's coming next? Well, that question also is going to depend on how we read and interpret and understand Old Testament prophecy. So today we begin a Sunday school series that's going to look at the foundation of how we understand Old Testament prophecies because before we just, before we just start interpreting Scripture, let's, let's think about how we interpret it. Let's think about the foundation and understand why we interpret Scripture the way we do, 
and not just do it on a whim or a fancy because in all honesty, down through the ages of the church, there has been significant differences in how well-intentioned people have interpreted Scripture, especially Old Testament prophecies. Okay? Now, this, this question, this study is daunting. Why? Because this book is pretty big. There's a lot of data to work with, right? So there's a lot of information here to work through. So, um, yeah, it's going to be challenging. And, and it's important to, to make clear at this point that someone coming to a difference of opinion at the end, we're not going to excommunicate anybody, all right? Um, and, 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 but also for all of us to come with a humble spirit and humble mind. There are things that, that I have, was taught in seminary and, and down through the years that I've come to re rethink and examine. And um, uh, we're using, a, I'm using a, a series of lessons that's a, a lesson book that's um, largely prepared by a professor up at uh, Shasta Bible College, uh, Dr. Gunn. And there are some things in, in his presentation I don't agree with. I, some things I just see differently. And that's okay. We, we, we can have the, the ability to disagree as long as we're careful to begin with, a, with a, a humble spirit and an open mind as we consider Scripture together. I don't know if you noticed when you came in, there's a, there are sheets out there for you to kind of follow our study, a one-page sheet like this. If you didn't get one, you're allowed to jump up and go get one now. Huh? I got the last one. Oh, you got the last one. Is there anybody that didn't get one? Okay. Joan, could we make a few more of those? We'll make a few more. We'll make a few more. Yep. Thank you. Abby's on it. All right, all right. So the, the title of the whole series is called Why Dispensationalism Matters. And so lesson one is what is dispensationalism? And, of course, the first question we're going to ask is what is a dispensation? Um, it sounds like a new, a new kind of corn chip or something, but it's not. And, and where does that word even come from? Well, it turns out the word is used in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where Paul says, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth in him. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times. Now, the word dispensation is a Greek word that is actually made up of, it comes from the word ha, for house or a, the administration of a house, oikonomia. And in fact, our English word economy comes right directly from that word. But really the idea is an administration. That's the idea of this word. So he talks about, um, he's talking about the fact that God has purposed things that there's coming a time, the fullness of the times has not yet arrived. And he says, at, at the time of the administration of the fullness of the times, something is going to happen. In other words, the way, that, the way that God administers time is not always the same. It's not that our clocks change, but it has to do with the fact that God administers uh, different things in different times in different ways. You say, well, wait a minute. Isn't God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yes, he is. But the truth of the matter is, is that he does not always operate with men exactly the same way. And we'll think about that a little bit more in just a moment. For example, John, uh, John the Baptist said, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, right there we're reminded that uh, there's a difference between God dealing with the people of Israel through the law and John the Baptist, who, who didn't even fully understand yet the gospel. John the Baptist, who was preaching a, a baptism of repentance, and yet it was already revealed to him that uh, the law was one administration, but there's something different, and that it has to do with what Jesus Christ would bring. And so he even uh, tips his hat in that direction. And so there's a, a different administration. So God never changes, but how he works with man has changed, uh, from time to time, and the way he works with mankind. So how has God changed? What, can you think of some ways in which God's administration with mankind has changed, just from what we read in the Bible? We don't have to do animal sacrifices. There was a time at which, yeah, Pete is happy. There was a time at which God 
commanded animal sacrifices. In fact, they were to do a sacrifice every day at the temple. And there was to be an annual sacrifice. And, and God's people were commanded on an annual basis to, to commemorate the Passover, which involved the sacrifice, the sacrifice of an animal. And, and we're not required to do those things today, are we? So we see that, that, that there were things that God commanded for his chosen people, Israel, that are not commanded for us today. And I, I'm, I'm always smile a little bit at, at groups that believe that you have to keep the law, you have to keep the Sabbath, for example, because they choose to keep one little part of the law, but other parts of the law they just completely ignore because it, it doesn't work. Because the same law that said you'll observe the Sabbath also said that you're to come to Jerusalem, your, males, your men are to come to Jerusalem three times a year for three festivals. Well, I don't know of too many uh, Seventh-day Adventists or others. I mean, they'll do the Sabbath and make that a, a religious thing that they have to keep for salvation, many of them. And yet they don't keep other parts of the law that were also the same law. So how do you choose what part? So what is dispensationalism? That's the question we want to look at today a little bit as we begin. And the author has chosen to begin this way with considering what dispensationalism is not. Because, you know, it's, it's always easy to set up a straw man and attack the straw man. And by the way, dispensationalists are, are often guilty of doing the same thing when it comes to looking at covenant theology. We need to be careful to not simply set up our own caricature that's a weakened one and then sort of like what you do with a virus, you know. You, 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 if you're going to give a vaccination to someone, you, you, you take a strain of the virus and you weaken it and then you inject that into a person's body so their own defenses. We sometimes do that theologically so we, we attack a weakened version. We don't want to do that. We want to be careful to be honest and consider. So what is dispensationalism? First, what it isn't. And what it isn't is it is not a view of Bible prophecy. Now don't get it wrong. It results in a view of Bible prophecy. But dispensationalism is not primarily a view of Bible prophecy. That's not what it is. It results in it, but that's not what it is in its core. Secondly, it's not Christian escapism. Christian escapism, what does that mean? Well, a lot of people think that the dispensationalism exists so that there's this rapture idea that we can be raptured away and miss out on all the bad stuff. And so it becomes a, a way of escaping. Well, indeed, uh, dispensationalism will result in an understanding of the rapture of the church, but that is not the heart of what dispensation is, dispensationalism is. And thirdly, Many people think that all dispensationalism is is a dividing time up into dispensations or administrations. Now, this one's rather interesting because, um, okay, indeed, dispensationalism ends up seeing the distinctions in administrations of how God dealt with different people in different times in the Bible. Um, but before you can attack dispensationalism as, as doing this, it needs to be remembered that even covenant theology people do recognize differences in different administrations in the Bible. So um, a in actuality, pretty much everyone that believes and teaches the Bible does accept that there are some different dispensations, or maybe they don't want to use that word, they would use the word administrations, and that's okay. Yeah, Randy? And we will look at that with time. We will try and, and see, look at that and identify what some of these dispensations look like today. We'll at least introduce them, but just, just barely that. So what dispensationalism is not, it's not just a view of prophecy. It isn't Christian escapism, and it isn't just dividing time into dispensations, although all three of those things somewhat result from dispensationalism. So what is it? If it isn't those things, what is it? Well, Dr. Charles Ryrie from Dallas Theological Seminary probably 60 years ago, 70 years ago, uh, came up with three essentials of what is the core. And uh, three essentials. W what is really at the core of dispensationalism? And I think this, this is, is helpful to, to think through. First of all, at the core of dispensationalism is the distinction between Israel and the church. Now, Eventually, it's going to be more than a distinction between Israel and the church. It's going to be a distinction between the church and several different administrations that God has done in past time. But primarily, 
it, it came from this distinction between Israel and the church. In 1 Corinthians 10.32, the apostle Paul, talking about Christian liberty and, and whether or not you should uh, eat meat sacrificed to idols and some complicated things, he said, give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. What, why, would he, why would he say that? What, who, who are these three groups of people? What do you think he meant by that? Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Okay. Yes. And then you have the Greeks who are the Gentiles okay. who have their gods and the way they worship and the sacrifices they make, and then you have the Church of God, us, the, okay. the Christians, who so, so don't doesn't believe it in seem, So doesn't it seem strange that Paul would continue to maintain this distinction, especially if the Church and Israel was one and the same? Why would he make this distinction? Because, in fact, when he's talking here about the Jews, he's talking about unbelieving Jews. The truth of the matter is, is that for much of the, of the time of the... Of, the nation of Israel as a nation, they lived in unbelief of God, many of them. And so he's referring to unbelieving Jews, unbelieving Greeks, or the third group is the church of God, which includes believers that are Gentiles or believers that are Jews. And the church of God is one, but he still makes this distinction. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, the, this word Israel appears over 2,500 times. That's a lot of times. What do you think Israel refers to? In the Old Testament. Huh? What does is, what is that word Israel refer to? Mary? It refers to the nation. Okay, it refers to a nation. Anything else? A person. Uh, it's actually Jacob himself. And then, and then it refers to his descendants. Okay? So, so remember, uh, Jacob got his name changed. He was wrestling with God one night, right? River Jabbok. And, and so his name got changed from Jacob to Israel. So his name went from being a, the supplanter <laughs> to being a prince, <laughs> wrestling with God. And, and um, so that word Israel is used all through the Old Testament, and it's even used in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament over 2,500 times, and not once does it refer to the church. Now, there are those who can take it and try and allegorically make it mean that but the question is is when the Old Testament was written whether it's uh, the, the Pentateuch or the prophets um, all the way up to the to the to, to the New Testament did the people who first read what was written did they ever look at the word Israel there and say oh that's talking about the church and the answer is no they they saw uh, that word as a reference to a people group or to Jacob himself, okay? Now, in the New Testament, the word church appears 110 times. Now, um, and, and in the New Testament, the word church never once truly refers to Israel. Now, there's, there's two little caveats. First of all, the word church in the New Testament is the word ekklesia, which means, we're often told it means the called out ones. Ek in Greek means out. Kaleo means to call. But really, the word means an assembly. I mean, sometimes I think we kind of stretch things when we, we push the etymology of a word way past its intended meaning. It's sort of like taking a rubber band and stretching it till it breaks. Um, just because the derivation of a word means something, I mean, we have all kinds of words that the derivation meant something at one time, but we no longer think of it that way. When, you, when it says, turn on a light, no, unless you have one of those dimmers that's a rotary, somebody says, turn on the light, we think no problem of flipping the switch. Okay, we understand what turn on the light just means go from off to on. And there, there are many things like that where the old, where the word came from is not exactly what we mean by it. And the word for church in the New Testament actually is a word that's in the process of changing. It's a word that's being coined. Here's a perfect example. 
when Paul was in Ephesus and there was this great uproar. The whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater with one accord having seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. It's the word ecclesia. So when Luke recorded this text and he used the word church, nobody thinks for a moment that he was talking about this mob of people in the theater in Ephesus as being a church. It, the word meant assembly. Okay, that's what, it, that's what it meant at that time. And so there are a couple occasions in the New Testament like this where it's used in that sense. And it turns out that Stephen, when he was giving his, his sermon right before he was stoned to death, in, in Acts chapter 7, also used the word ecclesia in reference to what happened in the Old Testament. This is he who was in the congregation, it's the same word, ecclesia, in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, and the one who received the living oracles to give us. And so some will say, aha, that proves that the church already existed in the Old Testament. The truth of the matter is, is the word is simply a reference to a congregation of people. And it does not necessarily require then that the church as an entity was already in existence in the Old Testament. It's simply a, a, an understanding of the use of the word. All right, so the, the truth of the matter is there is a distinction. There is a distinction between the use, the, uh, the idea of Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament. And we will, with, it, with time, we'll see that more clearly. Now, there are many non-dispensationalists who believe that the church was already in existence in the Old Testament, in Israel, spiritually speaking, figuratively speaking, I guess, and that at the same time, they would say that uh, the church today is the true Israel. So they end up putting and kind of making the two one. And let's be honest, there are some really fine theologians who believe this and have taught this over many decades and many centuries. The question is, are they really the same? Another question I have of, of this is, were there any, were there any believers before Abraham? Yes, there were, weren't there? So, all right, let's, let's back up before Abraham and think about, huh? Noah. Yeah, Noah. Was he a believer? Absolutely. Was he part of the church? Well, we would say that, but it, it stretches. What about, let's go back even further. What about Enoch? Enoch certainly walked with God. God took him. Was he part of the church? Boy, it really stretches, stretches our understanding of what church is to try and, and, and is it fair to say it's just Israel? It, it, it Really, when you come down to it, you have some real complications when you try and make the church equal with Israel in the Old Testament. All right. So, distinction between Israel and the church is one of the key essentials of what dispensationalism is all about. So... Briefly, the Bible teaches then about some distinctions. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, by the way, this is one of the very, very, very few occurrences of the word church in the Gospels. It may even be the only. Uh, Jesus said, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, in the Hebrew language, um, tense of the verb is determined by context. It's not determined by the verb itself. But in Greek, when it gives the temp, tense, future tense, past tense, etc., it's precise. The, the word changes, the spelling of the word changes, and it tells you this is not a present tense verb, this is talking about the future. And when Jesus said, I will build my church, it's clearly, unequivocally, future. Well, if the church already existed in the Old Testament, then why did Jesus say, I will build my church. Oh, in other words, the church did not exist or he would not have had to have said, he could have said, I will enhance my church or I will continue my church. No. He gave the impression, I've got a new construction project and it's going to be the building of the church. And he hadn't even explained it much at this point. 
So it was kind of a new idea uh, at this point, and yet he makes it very clear, very emphatic. So were there Old Testament believers in the, uh, believers in the Old Testament? Sure there were, but, but there are some fundamental differences between believers in the Old Testament and the New, New Testament. So what, what do you think of as some differences between... Uh, well, let's go here for a second. Luke, John, Luke chapter 7, verse 28. And we have this record of Jesus speaking about John the Baptist. He says, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. That's pretty high praise. But then look what he says. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wait a minute. If John the Baptist was the greatest of the prophets according to Jesus, and how could he possibly say, and yet he's le least, he who is least in the kingdom, rather, of God is greater than he. Well, that tells us that whatever was going on in the Old Testament up through the time of John the Baptist was going to be greatly changed in the church. So the church and Israel are not one and the same. There is a distinction clearly made, both in uh, the, the Old Testament and New Testament combined, but also in the very words of Jesus. So what are some other things that you think of, distinctions uh, that the Bible teaches? Just, take, just think about believers in the Old Testament and believers in the New Testament. What, what, do you, what jumps off the page for you as far as distinctions? Okay, for one thing, a whole new body of, of revealed truth, isn't it? Yes, all right? Him, him personally walking on earth and then all the scriptures that came concerning him and then all the epistles thereafter. Yes, Paul? Indwelling Spirit. Indwelling Holy Spirit. Totally different than, than what they had known in the Old Testament and therefore a whole new level of responsibility, wasn't it? So in, in the book of Galatians, there was a problem that there were teachers going around saying, you know, you need, Galatians are Gentiles, they're not Jews. And the teachers are going around saying, you need, to, uh, you need to practice the Old Testament law. You need to keep the Sabbath. You need to, the men need to be circumcised. You need to do the Old Testament law. So Paul writes very strongly to the Galatian believers, and he says, no, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He's talking about keeping the details of the law. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. Now, this is interesting because the whole idea of circumcision is, is that if you want to be saved, you have to do this mechanical, physical observation that the law required, that the Old Testament law required. And by the way, um, the majority of those who hold to... Um, uh, not dispensations, but, but hold the covenant theology or amillennialism, believe in the importance of circumcision, but they don't do physical circumcision. They do what? Huh? No, those who, those who do not, who reject dispensationalism, huh? infant baptism. They baptize infants. Think of it. The Roman Catholic Church baptizes babies. Think of it. Uh, Episcopal churches baptize babies. Why do they do that? Because they see circumcision and they believe that the baptism of infants is in the same category as circumcision. So if you're going to make sure that your child is a child of the covenant, you need to baptize them when they're born. So they sprinkle them with water. And then the confidence is that they were already under the covenant. So if they die before uh, you know, they get confirmed, they're already covered. It's kind of the idea, right? But Paul is saying, look, circumcision, that doesn't save, that doesn't save something. That's, that was under the law. He's saying, if you're going back to trusting in that, then, you, then, then Christ will profit you nothing. I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a, if you're going to live by that, then you've got to do the whole thing. You've got to keep the whole law. And he says, furthermore, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. And, and by the way, the same thing is true with regard to baptism. 
What, what happens when a person uh, comes to faith, let's say at, at 45 years of age, but they were baptized as an infant in a, in, a, in a church that practices infant baptism? Do we say, okay, you're already covered? No, why not? Because that baptism wasn't even their choice. And putting our faith in that baptism would be trying to go back and trust the law. And he's saying that's like, that's like being divorced from Christ. That's the opposite of salvation. No, salvation is about our, our putting our faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So we see that the distinctions are taught in Scripture. And in Galatians chapter 5, Paul makes it very clear. If you want to go back and keep the law, try and live according to the law, you are divorcing yourself from Christ. Now you may think, well, this is, Pastor, that's obsolete. Nobody really does that. No, un unfortunately, that's not true. There's a great deal of confusion on this point. There are many churches today, Christian churches, big churches, small churches, that still teach the fact that, or t teach the notion that, uh, that basically Israel and church are one, right? They don't make the distinction. And so there's a confusion about, well, then how much of the law do I have to keep? And that's a natural question. How much of the law do I have to keep? Unless we see that there is a real distinction between Israel and the church. Okay, distinction between Israel and the church. The Bible teaches the distinctions. God made promises to distinct groups. So it turns out that that God made promises to the nation of Israel that don't belong to the church. And he made promises to the church which don't belong to Israel. And if we don't see the distinction, then we may be expecting God to do something for us that he never promised to do. Right? And, and by the way, we also may mistakenly uh, ignore promises made to Israel, which he still intends to fulfill with Israel, and we may think, oh, he's not going to do that. No. If God made a promise to Israel, he's going to do it. He's going to fulfill it. Now, um, some would say that the promises made to Israel as a nation or made to Abraham have all transferred to the church. And this is often referred to as replacement theology. So that um, the church now receives all the things that were promised to Israel. There's a problem. And the problem is, is all of a sudden to do that, you have to allegorize a lot of things. Can I show you one? I just, this week, uh, finished reading the little book of Obadiah in my daily Bible reading. It's only one chapter long. Pretty easy, right? But look at Obadiah. The book of Obadiah, just one prophetic book. And because it's so short, it's easy to, to see this. The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord concerning Edom. Now, so there's two basic approaches to reading these Old Testament prophetic books. We can look at it and say, I'm going to interpret this, I'm going to understand this literally, or I can look at it and say, all the promises that were given to Israel now pass to the church, replacement theology. And so from that perspective, you would look at this and say, okay, now what did God mean when he said, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom? Hmm, let's see, what would that represent? And literally, some of the teachers who have taught uh, against dispensationalism and who have taught covenant theology would take the, the word Edom and they would break down the numerical value of the word. And they would say the, the first letter is the such and such letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so that's worth so many points. It's numerology, believe it or not, that's what they have often done. Because you can't just take it as Edom. I mean, what's Edom? That has nothing to do with us. In other words, if, if, you, if you don't take Scripture as being, these prophecies as being literal, then you have to come up with some explanation. Why is it even in there? It, the book of Obadiah is, is just cut it out of your Bible and throw it away. Or does it have meaning? First of all, why, what does this word Edom even mean? From a literal perspective, what does that mean? Edom was a place. It was a nation. As a matter of fact, the Edomites were descendants of Jacob, Jacob's brother, Esau. That's who the Edomites were. Remember? Remember Abraham, Isaac. Isaac had two sons. And their names were Jacob and Esau. And remember they were twins. And remember that Esau sold his birthright. And, and, and Jacob, the usurper, ended up becoming the, the chosen one of God. And so Jacob's twin brother, Esau, was the father of the Edomites. And it became a nation. It turns out that, that in the Old Testament times, the Edomites 
instead of considering Israel as their kin and as their brothers and supporting them when they were attacked, they were over there cheering on the attackers who destroyed Jerusalem. And in fact, they were jumping in to take advantage of, Jer of the uh, Israelites' property. And so this little book of Obadiah is a chastisement given from God upon the Edomites. These are real people, were. And it's a real, it, it really has meaning. And you can't just take it and say, I think it means this or I think it means that. No, it, it really has meaning all by itself. It says, so, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have a heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations saying, arise and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. And the next 14 verses describe uh, God's chastisement on the Edomites, on the people that are descendants of Esau. And you get to the end of it, and we read this. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain... Now, we can't just make that mean anything, because when this was written, there was only one my holy mountain. It's Jerusalem. That's what those people understood. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they, and they shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion, now can we make that out to be uh, a time of spiritual enlightenment? Or can we make that out to be um, Christians that are on fire for the Lord? Can we? No, it's a place. When they... When, when that was written and those people received it, Mount Zion meant one and only one thing, Jerusalem. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob. Now look at this. Here God reveals himself to, to, to Obadiah and he chooses to say the house of Jacob. Instead of saying the house of Israel, he says the house of Jacob. How come? Why would he throw that in there? Because he's harking back to remind us that Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. <laughs> and so he makes a specific use of the name Jacob as a reference to, to later who became, his name was changed to Israel, but there's a reminder, Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. And so in this book of Obadiah, we have promises made where God promises not only just to Israel, but he promises to the descendants of Esau that they will be destroyed because they refused to be obedient to God and to honor God's chosen people. So instead of taking and allegorizing and making this mean whatever we want, the, fa the truth of the matter is it's so much easier and correct to simply understand that God intended for this to be understood literally. Even if he uses figurative language, even if he uses a, um, a poetic structure, which in many cases he did. But he's really communicating real information about the future of what will happen, and it's based on historical accountings also. So one other part about this, when God makes promises in the Old Testament, if we reinterpret the promises the way we want, then we actually question and impugn the integrity of God. What we're saying is, is you can't trust God because maybe he's going to change it and make it mean something other than what he said. May I show you an example? We go back to God speaking to Abraham. God said to Abraham, I will establish my covenant between you, me and you and your descendants after you in their generations. Now, again, for an everlasting covenant, again, Abraham, he had Ishmael, right? But God says, no, it's not Ishmael. You're, that's not the, the son of promise. Abraham's thinking, God, I'm 99 years old. Sarah's 89 years old. It's, it's too late. God says, no, you're going to have descendants. And he says, I'm establishing my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations. So God makes promises to Abraham and his descendants. Now, for all of the, 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 the succeeding 1,200 years of Jewish history, what do you think the Jewish people would understand by that promise? Who was he referring to when he said that he was making a covenant between God and Abraham and his descendants? Who do you think they would see that as? Themselves. 
They were talking, it's talking about the physical descendants of Abraham, the Jewish people, right? Right. Well, that's interesting because those who do not accept a dispensational uh, understanding of Scripture would say, no, that refers to Christians today. That refers to the spiritual descendants of Abraham. And yet, for 1,200 years, no one saw that as, is that, is that what it really means? There's this new understanding. And besides, if God changes what he said to his chosen people, then how can any of us trust anything that God says? So God makes this promise. He says, between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. So if God made a promise to Abraham and his descendants that the promised land would be theirs forever and that he would be their God, then we have to wonder what would happen if God says, nope, you failed me, therefore you can't have the land anymore. I changed my mind. Because this promise, God does not say, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan if you remain faithful. Now, we will find in a subsequent covenant that God made with Moses that their right to stay in the land would depend on their obedience. But this promise that God get, gave that this land would belong to them forever, there's no if. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. And that's an extremely important distinction that oftentimes is left out. Now, so this leads us to Ezekiel chapter 36. Now, let's ju mentally jump, stay with me here. So Ezekiel is written from Babylon, from captivity, right? So the children of Israel have disobeyed God, and they've been judged, they've been kicked out of their land. The city of Jerusalem has been destroyed, right? And there they are in captivity, and Ezekiel, moved by the Lord, writes this prophecy. And he says, therefore, O mountains of Israel. Huh? Well, yeah. Uh, people who do uh, uh, literature and so forth would say, well, that's apostrophe. That's a, 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 a grammatical device, a, a metaphorical device called apostrophe. In other words, you, you, to make an emphasis, you pretend suddenly, you're talking to this group, and all of a sudden you pretend like you're speaking to some inanimate object in the room to humiliate the, the, the listeners to realize you're supposed to be listening. Okay. And, and so God suddenly begins to address the mountains of Israel as if they could listen. But it's to make a point. And so he says, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God to the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the desolate wastes, and the cities that have been forsaken. Which, by the way, weren't yet fully forsaken at the time this was written. They were in the process of becoming forsaken. And uh, that have been forsaken, which became plunder and mockery to the rest of the nations all around. Therefore, thus says the Lord God. So he's addressing the mountains of Israel and the rivers and the, and the valleys and, and all these places. And he says, surely I have spoken my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all Edom. Look, there's Edom again. The descendants of Esau, because they were there to step in and take the land that was left desolate. And, and, and against all Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession, they thought, oh, good, finally we get to take over the land of Israel, right? In order to plunder its open country, therefore prophesy concerning, concerning the land of Israel. So this prophecy given to Ezekiel is concerning the land. It's concerning the mountains and the hills and the rivers and the valleys. Now, what do you do if you conclude that these promises given to originally to Israel are now fulfilled in the church, they're now fulfilled by us, if that's true, what do you do with the mountains, the hills, the rivers, and the valleys? Has God promised to us, the church today, the mountains, hills, rivers, and valleys of Israel? Suddenly you're in a pickle. What do you do with this? Well, you have to allegorize it. It means that God wants us to be prosperous wherever we live. This doesn't even, doesn't even come close to saying that. It's talking, the people who first read what Ezekiel wrote recognized right away that God was promising to do something in the future with regard to the land. That's why 
prophesy concerning the land of Israel and say to the mountains, hills, rivers, and valleys, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy, my fury, because you have borne the shame of the nations. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I have raised my hand in an oath that surely the nations that are around you shall bear their own shame. But you, O mountains of Israel, again he addresses them, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are about to come. Wow. So he's talking to this place, the land of Israel, as it's desolate and abandoned. And he says, get ready. Get ready to produce again because I'm going to do something very special and my people are going to come. They're about to come. For indeed, I am for you. He's still talking to the land. And I will turn to you and you shall be tilled and sown. Oh, he's talking to the land. He's saying, as if the land could hear, but it's for our benefit. I'm going to do something after it's been a desolate and abandoned for many generations. I'm going, to, I'm going to cause it to be again tilled up and it's going to be planted with seeds and I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, all of it, and the city shall be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will multiply upon you man and beast and they shall increase and bear young. I will make you inhabited as in former times and do better for you than at your beginnings. Then you shall know that I am the Lord." So God is going to do something in that land. Yes, I will cause men to walk on you. My people Israel, they shall take possession of you and you shall be their inheritance. No more shall you, the land, bereave them of children. Look, God made this promise through Ezekiel to the people of Israel with regard to the land that he was going to bring them back to that land. The land would be desolate, it would be uninhabited, but there would come a time when he says, you're going, to be, you're going to be plowed and you're going to be planted and you're going to spring up and my people are going to come again. Well, guess what? We're living when that exactly is being fulfilled right now. So, so what do we do? Do we, do we throw that out and say, no, 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 that's not literal. We've got to have, understand it spiritually. I don't even know how you would interpret that spiritually. I don't even know what application you could make. So essentially... These prophecies of the Old Testament become a nuisance unless you understand them to be literal, that God really intends to do this with his chosen people, Israel. I see a couple flags waving in the wind. Yeah, Randy. No, it means it belongs, it, it, the promise was given to the children, to the descendants of Abraham. So it means that it belongs to the nation of Israel, to those people. You know, it doesn't even make that distinction, but it does say that, that because of this process, God is going to bring them back to belief. In fact, that's exactly what's going to happen during a seven-year period of time called the tribulation, is God is going to use that to chastise the people of Israel and bring them back to a point of saying, <gasps> we missed the Messiah. That's what it tells us in Zechariah chapter 12. Yeah. Okay, Jim. Did you have a question? You had your hand up a minute ago. I answered it. Okay. Of Israel. Right. Okay. Okay, so it isn't... The, the, some of these promises are not even based on their, on their faith and, and at all. In fact, uh, the, the one verse that just popped into my mind... Um, uh, let's see here. Yeah, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel inquire of me to do this for them. <laughs> God's going to put it in the hearts of unbelieving Jews to pray that they'll be restored to the land. And that has happened. That has happened over the last over 100 years. And God has taken them back even in unbelief. And he's in the process of purifying them. Yes, Paul. the church it occurred to me that Jesus said come unto me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest yes yes my yoke is easy my burden is light it's right. not under that old it's law. fundamentally different isn't it it's a fundamentally different approach so the author of our series says that uh, 
with regard to the distinction between Israel and the church, that failure to make this distinction leads to anti-Semitism. And I don't think most of us, that's not an issue for most of us. However, uh, this is a real issue, and we know so because the Apostle Paul addressed it in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 11, Paul, who was a Jew of the Jews, he realized that something was happening, that there was a shift, and it took them a little while to understand that God was transitioning away from the kingdom being offered to Israel, and there was something totally new being formed called the church. And he speaks, he says, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am myself, I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who, my, who are my flesh and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So Paul is, is saying that um, God's promises to Israel have not been rescinded. But they've, they've totally missed the benefit of these promises because they have they've disobeyed. They have rejected the covenant. But the covenant that God made with Abraham still has not been suspended or taken away. And so he says, you Gentiles, you're being drawn to faith in Christ so that you can be a provo provocation of the people of Israel to provoke them to say, oh my goodness, what have we missed out on? We've missed out on our Messiah. That's... That's part of the function of the church. We are to be a reminder to the Jewish nation, don't you guys get it? God still loves his chosen people, Israel, and he still has a plan. He's still working with them. And your Messiah has already been here once, and you crucified him. And here's this group of people from all over the world, some Jews, some Gentiles, all over the world, who have recognized Jesus as their Messiah. And the rest of you, what is up that you've missed this? And so God will actually use the church to provoke the nation of Israel to jealousy. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree, he's talking about Gentiles being grafted into belief in God, if you were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. Because that would be the danger, wouldn't it? The danger for Christians coming to faith in Christ is they're looking around at their, at their Jewish people around them going, come on, this is your Messiah. When are you going to wake up and realize? And the tendency would be to, to look down on them, right? Paul says, no, wait a minute. Don't boast against the branches. If you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. The root's ref a reference to Abraham, right? You will, then say, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Don't be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. <laughs> Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? You see, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until... The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That implies a time when things are going to change. That there will come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles will come to a completion and then God will continue to work still with his people Israel. There's been a blindness that has overtaken them. I'm fascinated by the, the One for Israel uh, group group. Um, uh, and, their, and, and their evangelistic effort amongst uh, Jews in Israel is absolutely mind-boggling. In, in a matter of 30 years, they've gone from 300 Christians, Jewish believers in Israel that, are, that, that believe in Yeshua, to tens of thousands. It's, it's absolutely stunning what God is doing in the nation of Israel right now. As they, and still, that's, a, that's a, just a drop in the bucket comp compared to the number of Jews. And yet, God is doing something very, very special in Israel. Okay. I'll just tease you with, with uh, the next major dis essential. 
and that is a consistent, consistently literal interpretation of the Bible. And uh, I, I look forward to showing a couple, just a couple examples of this next Sunday in Sunday school. Dispensationalism is about interpreting the Bible consistently, whether it's the Old Testament, New Testament. We believe that the Bible is to be interpreted literally. That does not ignore figures of speech, does not ignore uh, poetic structure. Old Testament, especially in the prophets, oftentimes re 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 um, used a poetic structure, as did David in the Psalms, that in no way takes away from the literalness of what's being communicated. So we'll talk about that next week. Um, man, I, you know, I'm just coming to, to appreciate God's Word more and more and more. The Gospel of John begins and says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him, nothing was made that was made. There's a lot more to the concept of God's Word, I think, than what we have realized. It's far deeper and more profound. God's Word ministers, changes us. It's powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. There's far more going on with this book than just dried ink on a page. And the more we learn to appreciate God's Word and understand what it is that He is speaking to us and, how, and not even understand, sometimes just absorb it and take it in and let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, we read, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God's Word is, is uh, far more powerful and profound than just studying it. You know, it isn't just about an academic, oh, okay, now I know this information. Oh, no, it goes way deeper than that. And we are so privileged to have it. Okay. All right. So um, there, are, there, there, there are little books that go with this study. Um, I don't know how many of you would want to have them. I didn't order them because I will make up, Lord willing, I will make up a study sheet each week. Um, the content is, there, you could do reading beforehand, and I could order enough if people want to have them. How many of you right now would say, yes, I want one of those books? I'll just quickly count. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, sete, oito, nove, dez, onze. Did you? Do okay. Doze. Okay. Well, well, we'll get like 15 or so. It's, it's interesting, and that way you can read ahead. Um, 15. Don't let me forget that number, magic number. Okay. Be back in seven and a half minutes. And, and, and help clear out the uh, foyer when it's time to start, would you? Help me? 